only imagine. I can only imagine, Lord, that, that heaven is so much better than what we are experiencing on earth today. All the carnage and the despair that's taking place in our world today, Lord, we, we, we hope for a better future, Lord, and you promise it to us in your word. We look forward to that better future. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for my friends here today that have come here with all different walks of life as we join together to worship you and to consider what your words are in the Bible and how we might apply those to our life today. Lord, help us to examine your word with open hearts. Let us gain hope from the words that you share with us today. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Well, thank you so much. Please be seated. Thank you, team. You guys did a great job today. Well done. Yeah, let's give him a hand for sure. We had a great guitar player. Yeah, well. <laughs> Chris <Yeah>. Hale. <laughs> you got it. That was a beautiful guitar, too. Chris is playing his new acoustic here today, and it sounded great, didn't it? I mean, just the, the richness of the tone. Uh, we can appreciate those things. And so, uh, Chris, thank you so much for making that big investment in that machine you've got there, and that we might enjoy it and be led into worship by it. So thanks a lot. And, and thanks for everybody coming, too. You braved the, the storm. I woke up this morning. I was a little late because um, I had to chisel off the candy coating over my whole vehicle. I'm sure you guys were all at the same place, right, too? Um, so that was unique. I, you know, in Edmonton, we, we, where I was from originally, um, a year ago, uh, we don't quite get that sort of uh, rain, ice thing that you guys get here. And so thank you, Sudbury, for um, giving me that wonderful experience. I loved it. Um, so anyways, we want to finish up today our Sermon on the Mount series. And we've been talking, uh, you know, it's, this is our seventh week of talking about this. No, I'm sorry, it's actually longer than that. I did seven of them, uh, whereas Jerry did a couple too. And Pastor Jerry is here with us this morning too, so just glad you're here with us today, Jerry. And, and you know, as we're finishing off with this Sermon on the Mount, we, and we've, we've been saying this over and over again in every one of our messages. The greatest sermon that has ever been spoken, the shared, the greatest thoughts on our humanity that have ever been shared. And universally, whether or not you follow Jesus or not, that statement that I just made there can be uh, respected and said by many people, even those that don't share faith as well, when it comes to the, the Sermon on the Mount. And being that it's held in such high regard, I think it's something we want to study, get down to understand what Jesus was saying to us and how we might apply that to our life because of the fact that it is so well respected and it can have life change for us. You know, as I was thinking about wrapping up today and what Jesus wraps up in the Sermon on the Mount, his final thoughts, it reminded me a bit of, a, of this experience I had down in California. So I love going to rides. And uh, how many here love rides? Like Disneyland, you know, um, Disney World, Universal Studios. Yeah, I see a couple here. Silverwood, that's down in Idaho where they got all the roller coasters. I mean, I love rides. I can't do spinning rides anymore, right? Because I used to be able to do those, but now I just get sick from them. But I mean, I love those thrill seeker rides all the time. I like, you know, uh, roller coasters. But what, one of my favorites rides is the Tower of Terror. Now, I, some of you actually may have been on the Tower of Terror. Have, has anybody been on the Tower of Terror, Terror in Walt Disney at Land, Disneyland, I think. It might be in World 2, but it's in, I know it's in Disneyland. Anybody, Tower of Terror? No, I don't see nobody here. Oh, Jerry's been on the Tower of Terror. Woo! <laughs> Excellent. Uh, if you're online, the Tower of Terror. So it's this one ride, and it's, it's, it's got to be 30 stories high and it's this box, and basically what happens in the ride is, is you get it into, and there's obviously this kind of movie setup that happens as you're being entertained, waiting in line for hours to get on this ride that's like literally lasts maybe for one minute. And, uh, but you know, you get into this ride, and you sit in this, in this tray, we'll say, and there's probably about 20 people in this tray. And uh, it goes, it's like an elevator, it goes up to, and you can't see anything, it's completely dark. So you get up to the top of this, this tray and it's kind of going up and, and music is playing and it's sort of ominous. And you get to the very top and then all of a sudden the ride starts and they basically flick a switch 
and then this tray just drops like it just there's nothing holding it it just goes straight down and drops and then it kind of feels like you're on a bungee and you hit the bottom and then you shoot back up again and then it opens up these doors and you can see how high you are you're up about 30 stories up in the air and then closes again and then it falls down again it starts up and down and moving around so i'm on this ride with my kids and my wife is beside me and we didn't know what to expect because it was our first time on this ride and so we didn't really know what was going to happen so i'm sitting there and we're going up this ride and i could feel her getting a little closer and closer to me as we are going up this ride kind of squishing in and we get to the top and as soon as that releases like this i felt this hand come down on my leg like it was like a vice grip just grabbed my leg and squeezed in like this and as we were going and it just got stronger and stronger as we were on this ride as it's going down and up and down doors open she's screaming everybody else is screaming in this thing and we finally get to the end of the ride well i look down on my leg now fortunately i was wearing pants because friends at the end i had a bruise on my leg and I am sure that if I was wearing shorts at the time, I would have had claw marks in my skin, right? So why do I bring up that story? Isn't it true that it's a natural response to us when we are in situations that are terrifying, scary? We reach out instinctively to grab onto something to help us in the midst of that situation. We ground ourselves when chaos is taking place, right? It's a bit of a natural instinct for us. So where then do we find grind, grounding when we find ourselves in a world like we live in today? You know, all of us are aware of what's happening over in Europe right now, in Ukraine, but not only there, but all around the entire world, there's this tension and, and this chaos, this challenging situations or despair even for some that's taking place. And in the midst of that, we always try to find for ourselves, how do I understand what's happening in my world? But more importantly, what do I grab onto when that same scenario begins to face me in my own life personally, us in our own lives personally? You see, Jesus himself, in these final thoughts of the Sermon on the Mount, he actually addresses that very thing when the world seems to be in chaos. You remember when we said we talked about Jesus and why was the Sermon on the Mount? What was the whole uh, motivation behind that? And first of all, it was two things, right? First of all, when he came, he explained why he came into this world. He came to show us who God was and that we needed a Savior. That was the one purpose that he came. But the second purpose was also in showing us how to live righteously in our lives. And that in living a righteous path for our lives, it's the best formula for success, for meaning in your life. And now we're at the end of this Sermon on the Mount and he goes back to talking about again, how we find meaning in the midst of chaos, how we find hope in the midst of chaos. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, as I was going through this, I had the same thought. How could Jesus' thoughts remotely be relevant to what's happening in our world today? That was literally 2,000 years ago where Jesus came to this earth. How could he possibly know or say anything to us that would have, have any relevance or importance in our situation? So, you know, I began to look at what, what it was like when Jesus was when he came into this world in person, what was the world like then? Here's a couple things that scholars say that the world was like. First of all, the aristocracy of Jerusalem, like the upper class, they had just created this fancy new subdivision by tax monies that King Herod was taking. He was literally financing this fancy area. The rich were living in opulence. A brand new temple was being built at the time. It was the center of political and religious importance. That was the, that the temple at that time and how important it was. And Herod literally wanted to make Jerusalem great again. It's kind of like mega, right? Make America great again, but we'll call it mega. Make Israel great again. That was his plan for what was taking place, King Herod's plan at the time. The Jewish council or the justice system was viewed with 
distrust politicians. Nobody trusted the politicians that they were making decisions in people's best interests. Just about everyone seemed to have an ulterior motive. From this perspective, and this is a quote, all the political power players of the time could be seen as false prophets. They said that they spoke for God, but clearly didn't. And political power players of the time could be seen, sorry, and holy rulers leading the common people down this primrose path to fund their opulent lifestyles. They were telling them what they wanted to hear to the poor people so that they could enrich themselves. Now, it even gets worse than that, friends. This sounds strangely familiar to what we experience today, doesn't it? But it gets worse for them. The country was still reeling from what King Herod had done when he butchered all of the children that were Jesus' age. If you recall in the Christmas story where he ended up killing all of these children in order to make sure that this prophecy about Jesus wasn't going to take place, or he tried, right? And then he also instructed everybody that wasn't, uh, that didn't worship Herod when he died. He instructed, his instructions were that they would, uh, people would be killed if they weren't to worship Herod after he had died. Talk about being a dictator. Israel at the time was also under foreign occupation by Rome. People were horrifically butchered if you were against Rome or you did anything as a crime and they were left outside for people to see what would happen if you went against Rome. For instance, being crucified. Anything that defied the state that was the consequence of being left outside as a demonstration of how powerful Rome was. Roman rule at the time demanded imperial worship. What's imperial worship? They made a god out of the emperor, Emperor uh, Caesar, and they expected the citizens to worship him as if Caesar was a god. Kind of not unlike the North Korean regime that we see today in the world. Religious ceremonies, they celebrated prostitution. In fact, children that were not Roman citizens had no laws governing them and often were subject to child sex slavery. So the world that Jesus came into was awful, awful more awful than what we even experience in our world today. So when we consider about the times that, that Jesus' words, when he was speaking into us, and we think of ourselves, well, he can't possibly have anything to, to say to us today, it really, his world that he came into doesn't really look that far off from our world, does it? It was chaotic, our world is chaotic. So he introduces his Sermon on the Mount. He finishes off with about why he came. And then he talks about righteous living as a Jesus follower and how I'm meant to live out and respond to why Jesus came. And then at the very end here, he offers us this grounding that we so desperately desire and need in our lives, our lives that are upended right now, just like they were back when Jesus came into this world. See, Jesus ends this Sermon on the Mount with a hope and a promise a hope and a promise that we so desperately need that we can grab onto, not unlike my wife did when we were in the Tower of Terror, that we might confront that world and the chaos that's taking place right now. So here's what he finishes off with in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, and he says this, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. You know, in thinking about this, I, I wanted to go back to the question that I think Jesus is inferring and asking us when he states this, and that's this. What is the point of life and what happens when I die? You think about those two questions and those questions I've been wrestled with for thousands and thousands of years by people that were involved in philosophy, art, theater, movies, music, sociology, the study of humanity. 
These are the questions of life that all of us ask. And I think those are the questions that Jesus is posing to us when he states what he does in this verse about the narrow and the wide gate. Because the question is this, what is the point of life and what happens when I die? If we were just to live life for increasing the pleasure of ourselves in life or pain avoidance, What happens when we are confronted with chaos, anxiety, turmoil, like what's happening in the world? When I think about that question, I think we have two choices that we're able to confront or we are confronted with, and that's this. First of all, we can either bury our heads in the sand and choose to live life in low resolution. Sean, well, what do you mean by that? I understand burying my head in the sand, but what do you mean by low resolution? Low resolution is sort of the idea that, you know, back in the 80s, we had video games, and they were considered low resolution, kind of blurry a little bit, not high resolution, like we might see with our eyes, like we're looking at each other right now. Low resolution would be this kind of a blurry, fuzzy sort of image, right? And we could look at things, we can think about our spirituality At times, we can think about the world today and continue to look through it through low resolution, not really investigating, not opening our eyes fully to see what the world is doing, why I then need to ask those questions about my spirit inside, what is the point of life, and what happens when I die. So that's our choice. We can either choose to bury our head in the sand, live in low resolution, or we can face the chaos that takes place in our world right now And think about what happens when it comes to our, my, eternity in heaven. See, it seems to me that when I think about that question of what's most important in life, what is the point of life, and what happens when I die, I think the question is, what is most important is your soul, your spirit. And in addressing your soul and the most important thing in life and eternity Jesus is telling us that when we address that, when we think about those thoughts, that when we are wanting to confront that truth and think about what it means to get into heaven, he says that it's surprisingly narrow, the path to get there. The road is narrow, is what Jesus says. And what are the implications of that statement? What does it mean when Jesus says the road is narrow? First of all, I think it says that not every path in our lives Not every path leads to knowing God and knowing eternity. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, not all religions are the same. I think that's what Jesus is telling us in this passage. Well, what do you mean, Sean, not all religions are Spain? They're all spiritual. They're all unseen. They all rely on a higher power. There's all heaven that they're hoping for. They all claim that they are right. You see, there's one major difference between all religions and Christianity. There's others, but I want to talk about the main one that differentiates Christianity from every other religion, any other cult that's out there, and that's this. Christianity is the only religion that has as its foundational belief grace. It's the only one that would say that Jesus, you can't earn your way into heaven, but Jesus, only through accepting him, what he did in giving us forgiveness, we can only accept Jesus, a higher uh, eternity for ourselves when we accept this idea of grace. Through surrendering our life to his mercy. And we accept that mercy of Jesus and come to trust trust in his words because he tells us this afterwards talking about the road being narrow. He says this, that no one can come to the Father but through me. That's in Matthew. That's a bold statement, isn't it? And yet, we must take it seriously if we're gonna be Jesus' followers. See, that's just one example of the road being narrow that Jesus tells us about as we are considering what's most important in life. The other thing that I think when Jesus talks about the road being narrow is this, that being spiritual isn't enough to realize a spiritual eternity for ourselves. You're thinking to yourself, but Sean, I I am good, I am a spiritual person. And let's reverse engineer that thought for a minute. 
I am good, therefore I have earned to be in an eternal life. So think about that for a minute. And I know you've heard that before, and I have family that even has even expressed that to me as well, but I was thinking about how it breaks apart when you think about how the mechanics of that might work. Like, who is invited to this good place? Are you all alone? Who's allowed in? Who decides who is allowed in? Are you personally good enough to decide if other people that might be in the same good place to come in? What if there are people there that aren't good enough? What if there's people that are there in this good place that you invited because they are good and they've invited somebody else that you feel isn't good enough to be there? What happens in that case? Are you so good that you decide who gets in and who gets out? You see, we need for ourselves, when we think about eternity, we need to have an ultimate good that leads us into the eternal. That is God. That is Jesus. The ultimate good is God, which can only be accessed through Jesus, the narrow gate. See, we can't achieve eternity or spirituality by being good enough. You know, the other thought about this narrow gate in about being spiritual not enough to enter into heaven is this. I, I am a spiritual person, therefore I believe that at the end of my life I'll be into a, a spiritual place. We create this eternity for ourselves in our mind based on our own self-assessment and our imagination. If I imagined, if I was Superman right now and I decided to, to you know, get on top of the pyramid over here and jump off it, would my imagination, would my belief be enough to sustain me to be able to fly? All of us here would say, no, that's not possible. And we have to apply that same logic when we're thinking about our spirituality, that it's just enough to be a spiritual person in order to get into heaven. I think that that falls apart when we think about that concept, that belief enough isn't enough. Belief or being spiritual isn't enough to get us into heaven. See, we need to look to Jesus as our direction for our spiritual life which includes this road, description of this road being narrow for us. And we have to take it seriously. Jesus goes on to say, as he's wrapping up this Sermon on the Mount, he talks about these false prophets. And he says this, watch out for false prophets. Then this is Matthew 7, 15. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So what is a false prophet? What does Jesus mean when he says this? False prophets are those that claim to speak on God's behalf, but have their own agenda. That is what a false prophet is. So does that happen today? When Jesus gives us this warning about when we're thinking about our spirituality, we're thinking about heaven, and there's false people, people that want to talk into our lives, does that same thing happen today that happened back then? And of course it does. You know, I was thinking about this, that every single person out there believes that their thoughts are on the side of angels. What Jesus is encouraging us here is to intelligently examine those that make this claim about truth, about eternity, about deep spirituality, and ask, is there good evidence that those claims are true? But see, that question is also meant to be an examination of ourselves. Am I a false prophet? Do I claim to know God, but I've got another agenda in mind, or... I don't quite believe it myself. See, earlier on in that chapter in Matthew, Jesus warns us to judge ourselves first, to look out for the beam in our own eye rather than turn our attention to the speck in somebody else's, right? That illustration which says we need to make sure that we ourselves are thinking through our own spirituality, are thinking through our own life choices before we actually judge somebody else. 
that question was, when, G, when we read about this false prophet, we reflect it back on ourselves, ask, am I a false prophet? By asking ourselves, do I bear fruit for God's glory? Jesus then says in this wrap up, he talks about the true and false disciples and he says this in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, evil doers. See, the warning of Jesus here applies to people who speak or say things to Jesus or about Jesus, but don't really mean it. And it isn't that they believe that Jesus is a devil, they simply say the words very superficially. Their mind is elsewhere, but they behave with, they believe that there's no value in the bare words and, and fulfilling some kind of religious duty with no heart, no soul, no spirit, only bare words and passing thoughts. So the warning of Jesus applies to people who say, Lord, Lord, and yet their spiritual life has nothing to do with their daily life. They go to church, they perhaps fulfill some daily religious duties and yet sin against God and man just as any other might. You know, I heard this one quote once from somebody when it came to this idea of asking that question when, when Jesus says, Lord, Lord, only those that land of the kingdom do the will of my Father. And didn't we do these things? And the question was this, is that just going to church doesn't necessarily mean you know Jesus. Kind of like saying just going to McDonald's doesn't make you a Big Mac, right? That's what Jesus is saying here, and that's what he's asking us. Is this, is that what does make me a Christian? What is it that I have to be or do in my life that going to help me to get through these difficult times that are going through life right now that's gonna assure me of a heavenly place and eternity? First of all, it's this, I think it's a heart that surrenders. It's a heart that surrenders. It's an acknowledgement of Jesus' mercy and a prayer of faith in accepting his forgiveness and grace. I want to see that again. What makes you a Christian? What is it that I can feel like or know in my heart that there is an eternity for me, that I am a believer of God? It's acknowledgement of Jesus' mercy and grace and a prayer accepting his forgiveness in our hearts. I think the other thing that, that is an assurance of us being a believer, that Jesus wants us to be more than just going to church, is a heart that's passionate and fully committed. You know, it says this line in Revelation chapter 3, it refers to churches, but we can apply this to ourselves as well. And, and this is what it says, and to the angel of church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing not realizing that you were wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. That's quite a rebuke, isn't it? And I think that rebuke, though, it, it encourages me that I want to live my life sold out for Jesus. I want to align myself with his commandments. Like I said in other ser sermons, right? Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. I want to keep his commandments in my life, knowing that as I'm doing that, not that it's earning my way to heaven, but that it's a reflection of an inner reality in my spirit. You know, this other verse that Jesus talks about, when we think about this idea of being passionate and fully committed, it's in Matthew chapter 10, it says, but everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Those two verses together tell me that being fully committed to Jesus means not just paying him lip service, but surrendering every aspect of our lives. What did we talk about when it came to the last sermons that we've talked about in the Sermon on the Mount? Jerry spoke about it himself. What does it mean to be blessed in your life? And we talked about what it means to have hate in our hearts or unforgiveness, right? 
all of these aspects of righteous living that God calls us to. That's what it means to follow after God fully and committing, committed fully is in following his commandments in our life. See, in the end, there, there's only, there is one basis of salvation and it isn't merely verbal confession, just me saying, Jesus, forgive me. It's not spiritual works, but knowing Jesus and being known by him. It's our connection to him by the gift of faith that he gives to us that secures our salvation. Connected to Jesus, we are secure. Without connection to him, all these miracles and great works prove nothing. That's what Jesus is saying. So the question is, we need to ask ourselves is this, what are we going to build our lives on? What are you going to build your life on? Because if you, when you build your life on your relationship with Jesus and you internalize that, you express that through every aspect of your life and your decision making. So why, why would I do that? Jesus is calling me to do this. But remember I said at the beginning that Jesus finishes off the Sermon on the Mount with a hope and a promise? This is what he says in Matthew chapter seven. I'm gonna ask the band to come back as we get it ready for communion. And this is what he says in Matthew chapter 7, 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. See, in that passage, you know what struck me is this. At the end there, both people were in the process of building, weren't they? And it's a universal precept of our lives, isn't it? That we are all building something, building in towards the future, right? We are building a family. We are building resources. We are building an education. Uh, we are building a business. We are all in this process of building. And the warning that Jesus leaves us with at the end of his Sermon on the Mount is this, that are you building on this foundation of sand, sand that blows away and destroys the building that you were creating in your, your life? Or are you gonna build on this foundation of Jesus Christ, this solid rock, by following after Jesus and keeping his commandments in your life? You see, the, what's interesting about this illustration is the storm, right? F rain, floods, winds. It was the ultimate power that Jesus was trying to explain to people that were listening, not unlike the ultimate power that maybe we think about today with nuclear power. See, Jesus warns us in this that the foundations of our lives are going to be shaken at times, both now in our trials and in the ultimate judgment before God. But here's what he says. The promise is that if we stand on the foundation of faith in Jesus, we will stand. See, if you do this, you're going to have a victorious life today and a better hope for tomorrow. That's what Jesus is, is asking of us, and that's what he's promising us in this final part of his message. And that's a question you want to ask yourself. What does my tomorrow look like? See, we are all walking towards the end, aren't we? Maybe it's far off. Maybe it's tomorrow. We never know. We don't know what that might happen in our lives. The question comes, though, is what steps have you taken to address this very real need in your life and the very real spiritual situation? So let's back up to the beginning. Why did I talk about the Tower of Terror? Why did I share with you about the world that Jesus lived in is very like our world today? What's well, because of this, and this is the hope. When we are in this tower of terror, when we need to grab onto something to make sense of the chaos of our world right now, when we have to have a future hope that it's not all meaningless what we're going through in this life, we need to grab onto something, and that something is Jesus. That's what he's telling us today. I 
are you going to grab onto Jesus? The one that you can have a profound trust relationship with as your outward actions reflect an inner reality. Jesus, the one that came into this world that understands the same chaotic environment because he lived it back then as we are living in today. You see, I can trust his presence, his thoughts, his spirit in the same relevant message that Jesus gave me back in the Bible. As a result of that, I'm going to follow Jesus passionately forever. Let me encourage you to do the same. We can find our hope into the rock that Jesus is for our lives. Let's pray. Yeah, thank you for these thoughts today, Lord. As we wrapped up your Sermon on the Mount and you, you talked about these very real concerns that you had, Lord, the gate is narrow. How do you address that, Jesus? You, 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 you told us that we need to follow you, Jesus. You warned us, Lord, that, that, that we can get distracted. We can follow things that are untruth, but we test them through seeing what the fruit is in their lives, but also in our own lives. And you ask us that question too, Lord, am I a false prophet? Am I paying, paying lip service to you, Jesus, or am I following you fully with every aspect of my life? Thank you for that reminder. Thank you for the reminder, Jesus, where you said that Some that in the end days, when, they, when we meet our maker, that we say, well, we did all of these things for you, but we really didn't know you. I thank you for that reminder that it takes us uh, to take a, a moment of a self-inventory for ourselves, that we, the areas of our lives that we haven't surrendered to you, we give them back over to you, Jesus, and we say, please, Lord, forgive us for trying to take control of areas that we are meant to give to you, Lord. Help me to fully follow you and be a righteous believer. And thank you, Lord, as you remind us that as we all are going through life, as we're all building towards things, as we build it upon you, Lord, the solid rock, that very thing that we grab onto and we find our lives chaotic, ups, upside down, we just thank you, God, that you are there and you encourage us to grab onto you, to build our foundation on you. So help us, Jesus. Forgive us of our sins and help us to follow you for the rest of our lives in appreciation of what you have done for us. Amen. Well, we're going to go to communion at this time as, as Stephen leads us in us reminding us what Jesus did for us in helping to rebuild a relationship with God that was damaged.